Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for coming. I'm so delighted to have so many of my friends and colleagues and former students and family here as well. Now, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that all the technology works, because as we all know, it doesn't always want to cooperate. Um, you'll notice that up there, there's a, an incomplete title. And uh, I thought I should share with you the difficulties I had coming up with a title. Uh, I was greatly honored to be asked to, to talk here today. And um, I wanted to share some things with you, but I was, there was so much that was running through my head. I just didn't know quite where to begin. So I began with this. I put a title up there, the last lecture, and I didn't know what to put. So I'm going to give you a title in, in just a couple of minutes. But as I was thinking about this, it made me think back, quite frankly, about my entire career. Um, here I am right now, really, I guess you'd have to say at the end of it, though I expect to be keeping my hand in a little bit in the next few years. Um, and what it did initially was to uh, take me back to the beginning, where I got my start in academia, which was at Brown University. This is the Walter S. Hunter Laboratory of Psychology. Uh, I spent a lot of time in that building when I was an undergraduate student at Brown. And uh, a few things happened there. Uh, I fell in love three times in that building. I fell in love with my wonderful wife, who's sitting there in the third row, and that was forever. And I fell in love with research, and that was forever. And I fell in love with teaching, and that was forever, too. So I was a very lucky man during my years at Brown. Now, when I think back to what happened at Brown, it strikes me that I had an opportunity at Brown that a lot of our students have had here. As undergraduates, they get an opportunity sometimes to get involved in research, to get involved in teaching, and that really shaped who I was. In particular, I think, the teaching, because I, in my fourth year, I was given the opportunity to lead some uh, undergraduate laboratories in the psychology department. And I went in there and just fell in love. This was fantastic. It was absolutely the, the, the best thing I'd ever done in my life that related to school, and I wanted to do more of it. And fortunately, over the years while I was in graduate school, I had lots of opportunities to teach. Uh, in those days, uh, preparation for going to the classroom as a teacher consisted of, here's the book, here's the course number, go teach. The unwritten assumption was, if you know it, you can teach it. And be, the first, I didn't know any better. I thought that that was true, that I was going to go in there and know how to teach. And as I look back on it now, I realize, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't do too much harm back then when I, when I first started teaching. But what happened at, at Brown was really influential because it, it gave me the bug to teach. And fortunately, I had a, an opportunity to pursue that throughout my entire career. Now here's another location that had a, a pivotal effect in my life. For many years I carried out animal research. I worked with animals like Siamese fighting fish and rhesus monkeys and rats and mice and gerbils and mostly with hamsters, doing research mostly on uh, eating behaviors. As time went by, I was going to various sessions that related to teaching and learning. And I was becoming more and more interested in teaching and learning, and I went to this place, the Faculty Development Summer Institute at Prince Edward Island, July of 2002. And for the few years before that, I'd been thinking, you know, I'm really loving this stuff that relates to teaching and learning, but I had an NSERC grant, I was doing animal research, and there really wasn't enough time to devote myself too much to the teaching and learning stuff because of all of the animal research that I was doing. And I thought and thought and thought about this and went to this five-day session, which, by the way, if you ever get a chance to go, it's absolutely fabulous. And I had a conversation with a, a, an educational developer by the name of Serge Pichinen from University of Ottawa. And I said, you know, Serge, I'm sort of torn here between the animal research, which I really enjoy, and the teaching and learning stuff that I want to do more of. I said, I, I don't know what to do. And he said, you know, David, I think you've actually already reached a decision. You just don't know it yet. And I had to give some serious consideration to what Serge had said because he was absolutely right. And it was really right here that I decided, okay, I'm going to have to drop the animal research and focus the rest of my career 
on issues relating to teaching and learning. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. I thank my lucky stars every day that I did it. So the title here, I still haven't given you the title. I thought about what am I going to do here and I read up about, uh, you know, the last lecture stuff and I looked at Randy Pausch's presentation which I couldn't even begin to come close to. And then I thought, well, let me look to see what they've put out in the advertising. And I saw these words. An opportunity for David and Lauren to share their almost 70 years, and that sort of made me blanch, <laughs> 70 years, of teaching and learning wisdom from their tenure at Brock University. Okay, well, that was sort of helpful. And then I thought, well, I'll do what all good academics do when they're sort of stuck. I went to Wikipedia, <laughs> and I found these words that characterized the last lecture. What wisdom would you try to impart to the world if you knew it was your last chance? And I noticed the thing that these two statements had in common was the word wisdom. So I thought, okay, gosh, I can give a lecture about my wisdom. and How much time can I fill up with that? I, feel, I just couldn't see how to do that. And so what I thought, well, I know what I'll do. I'll do what I've done in the past. I'll take other people's wisdom and I'll make it look like it's my own. <laughs> so we're gonna have some pearls of wisdom about teaching and learning today. And what I'm gonna do is, as I said, I'm just gonna take some other people's thoughts and ideas and work with them. Emerson, writer, philosopher, the secret of education lies in respecting the pupil. I think this is where it all begins. We as teachers, I think, have to recognize that we get a fantastic opportunity to work with typically younger people than ourselves and help them to develop as human beings. Whatever your discipline happens to be, whether you're a psychologist or a historian, an economist, whatever it happens to be, we get a chance to work with our students. But to do that effectively, we first have to respect them. Imagine if you were in a situation in your life where you're working closely with someone and you know that person does not respect you. Every day is going to be no fun. You're not going to be enjoying yourself if you're in that kind of situation. So think about our students and how we relate to our students. We have to respect them if we're going to have a good relationship and a good working relationship. And unfortunately, occasionally I've come across university instructors who clearly don't have a whole lot of respect for their students. Uh, I remember being at a, a session, and it was in a good size room like this one. It was pretty, pretty well filled with academics. We were talking about issues relating to the undergraduate program. And a faculty member stood up, and I remember this so vividly, and he started his comments with, consider the typical university undergraduate student. Can't read, can't write, can't think. And I thought, oh, how sorry do I feel for that guy, students. That is just the wrong way to be approaching what you're doing. You know, if you don't like this job, there's other jobs in the world to take. You don't have to be a professor. This is a great job. But if you don't start with the important things, you're going to get into some serious trouble. I got a cartoon for you. This is one of my favorites. Well, Duncan, if you've been saving your brain for a special occasion, this is it. You've got to be careful what you say to your students. In the wrong situation, a student might take this to heart the very wrong way. Oh, I'm not respected here by this person. Now, Lauren Adams, I, I've used this previously in a presentation. Lauren Adams has a relationship with many of his students where he could get away with this, no problem, okay? He could probably say this to 90% of his students and everything's fine. But not everybody can do that. I had a number of students over the course of my career where I could do this kind of thing and not cause any waves in the relationship. And sitting here in our second row is Tim Murphy. He took my really large uh, second year Psych 2F23 class, the statistics class, the, as I often call it, the dreaded statistics class, the one that most students don't want to be in. It's like the 24-week root canal, okay? <laughs> and Tim took this course with me uh, back in 1989, I think it was. And uh, I hit him in the head once during an exam because he kept asking me annoying questions about the multiple choice questions that I had, I had put on the test. 
And there were things, well, do you mean this or do you mean this? And he, he did this a couple of times. And finally, one time, I, I went to him and I answered his question. I said, oh, Tim, only you could think of these things. And I gave him a little whack upside the head. And Tim and I had a relationship where that was perfectly OK. But you have to know your relationship with your students. You have to know yourself. And you have to know your students if you're going to respect them adequately. E.B. White, writer probably best known for these works, Charlotte's Web, Strunk and White. Everything is news to an undergraduate. Now, that's probably a bit of an overstatement. I don't think it's all news to an undergraduate. But I think what's important for us as teachers is that we have to mind the gap between ourselves and our students. Our students aren't just like us. When I go into a classroom, for example, I'm typically the only guy in his 60s in that room. There's usually a big divide of decades in our age, in our life experience. I've obviously got a whole lot more education than they do. I spent so many years in school, I lost count of how many years I was there. So we have to mind the gap. And keep in mind that our students are not just like us. I'll give you an idea of what I mean. Definition of the word seminal straight, well, it's straight off the web, naturally. I, I have a dictionary at home, one of those big old brown ones, but I don't know where it is, so I had to go to the web to get this. Um, I once had an opportunity to have a, a dinner with a, a, a wonderful psychologist by the name of Sam Mudd. He was actually distantly related to Samuel Mudd, who treated John Wilkes Booth after he had shot John Kennedy. This was at Gettysburg College in the United States. And uh, he was telling me this great story, and I had to share it with you today. He said he was giving a lecture one time. It was in the developmental psychology, and he used this word in his lecture. And he used it several times, talking about seminal thinkers, seminal theories. And he thought, this was good lecture. On the examination, one of his students wrote this <laughs> on the exam. Quite clearly, what <laughs> Sam had thought was so perfectly clear had gone right over a student's head. And one of the things we want to keep in mind is we don't know when this is happening sometimes. So we really have to be very thoughtful about the way we present our, our information, our nuggets of information to our students so that they're getting the message clearly. Now, I had a similar problem myself. I'm certainly not immune to this. Uh, a number of years ago when I was teaching my statistics course, toward the beginning of the course, we have a big section on probability because, hey, if you're going to do statistics, you've got to know about probability. And so we start off doing what is very common. We were talked about cards and dealing with questions like this. What's the probability the top card on the deck will be red and the second card will be a spade? And here's how you do all of that. And this one time I gave this lecture, I thought this was good. This was really good. They're walking away knowing exactly what I'm talking about. And a young lady came up to me at the end of the lecture. And she said, can you please tell me, sir, what are cards? And I was flabbergasted. I had no idea that there were people in the world who simply had no clue what cards are, and therefore had no clue what this whole lecture had been about. It was like I was talking in a completely foreign language to her. It influenced the way I do my teaching. When I, whenever I encounter something like this, I've always tried to make the most of it. So one of the things I've done ever since then is I actually put this right in the course material. And I say, Here's what a deck of cards is. This is what it looks like. And I have decks of cards available that I, I use as demonstration purposes to make sure that we don't have a gap between me and my students so that we're all on the same page as we go along. Speaking of cards, this is a quote from a fellow by the name of Orson Scott Card, who's a, a writer. And I came across this quote. I've been collecting quotes for years and years. I came across, across this quote, and I, I thought it's, it's perfect. And I realized that it actually relates very closely to something that is very important to me. And it relates to my friend and colleague, Zepito Marini, who's in the Child and Youth Studies Department. And a number of years ago, I think 12 or 13 years ago it was, he published an article little one-pager called A Teacher as Sherpa Guide. 
Now this was around the time that I was really starting to get more and more interested in issues related to teaching and learning. And I was thinking about who I am as a teacher. This was around the time when I first started putting together a teaching dossier. And for those of you who've never done that who are teachers, you've really got to think about doing this. Because one of the things that makes you do is to think about what it is you're doing. Because it's very easy to go in and do your teaching year after year after year after year without giving a lot of thought. I'm pretty much doing what I did last year, but of course, I have to update the material. But you never think about how you're doing your teaching. You never think about the role that you're playing as a teacher. And putting together a teaching dossier makes you focus on that. So I was in the process of putting together a teaching dossier, and I came across this little article. This is a, a little bit of what Zepito had to say there. Have a read. The last part, what better facilitator of mountain climbing than a Sherpa guide? And I read this article and I said, that's me. That's how I think of myself and I've just never realized it before. And so when I looked at this, the teacher as Sherpa guide, I realized, you know what? There's a lot packed into that metaphor that relates <coughs> to me as a, as a teacher. This helped me to frame the way I think about myself and what I do, and it actually influences what I do in the classroom on a very regular basis, the way I think about myself and some of the things that I do. So in fact, on the very first day of class in my Psych 2F23 class, the dreaded statistics, I typically start off showing the students this. And I say, you know what? I know for a lot of you, Psych 2F23 is going to be like climbing Mount Everest. You're looking at this and thinking, oh my gosh, I can't do this. We get an awful lot of students who come in, their math background might, may not be very good. They may have a lot of math anxiety. So just talking about mathematics, palms start to sweat. And they need to know that we'll be there to help them through it. So I start off with this. This is Mount Everest. Look how big it is, how forbidding. Well, let me take you back, and I show them this. This is the first guy to ever reach the top of Mount Everest, Sir Edmund Hillary back in 1953. I was a wee little kid, but I remember when this happened. It was big news. This was huge news. He got to the top of Mount Everest in June of 1953. So it can be climbed, but just as importantly, maybe more importantly, he didn't do it alone. When he climbed Mount Everest, he had with him this man, much less famous, but no less important, Tenzing Norgay, who was one of the local people, a Sherpa, who worked as a mountain guide. And Tenzing Norgay helped Edmund Hillary to get to the top of the mountain. What's his role as a Sherpa guide? He knows the local terrain, the weather conditions. He knows how to tell you to prepare for what's going to come. He lets you know where the dangerous bits are going to be. He can maybe pull you back if you're going over the edge. He helps you get to the top of the mountain. So I introduce myself to the student says, you're a Sherpa guide. I know this isn't going to be easy but I'm going to be your Sherpa guide. And your TAs will all be Sherpa guides to help you to make it to the top of the mountain successfully. I actually carry this theme through the course. So from time to time, up on the screen, I will give students a tip from your Sherpa guide. Uh, here's something you want to know about, OK? This, this might be a little bit off of what we're doing in the main stream of the lecture, but you know, Think about this. Hey, a little reminder. And so there's Tenzing Norgay and a little tip from your Sherpa guide. Okay. Hey, watch out for this. You could go over the edge there and get yourself into some serious trouble. Think about this. Oh, and by the way, there's a, this other little thing. And after each section of the, the class notes are completed, I post up all of the Sherpa tips so that students can have them readily available. So they're all posted up on Sakai for them. So it's a, again, it's a, a way of helping the students to, to be successful. I have found this metaphor works beautifully for me. It may not work for you, but 
think about the metaphor that's going to help you capsulize who you are as a teacher. It can make your teaching experience a much richer one. So there's Zapito again, and I just want to add, Zapito, thank you, because you made an enormous difference in my life, not only as a friend, but as a teacher. Dale Carnegie, how to win friends and influence people. If life hands you a lemon, make lemonade. This is a really good idea, good advice. I really believe this. Let me tell you about a particular instance where I think life did give me a lemon and I was able to make some decent lemonade out of it. December 1990, I get the flu, the real flu. Not that I threw up twice last night kind of flu, the real flu, the fever, the chills, the headache, the nausea, the, you name it, I had it. I don't know if I looked as bad as this guy looked, but I sure felt as bad as this guy looks like he feels. And I was sick for like a couple of weeks. As time passed, I started to feel almost human. Could get down a cup of tea and things like that. And this one morning I woke up and I looked down at my hands and I thought, oh, I got a problem with my hands. Now, the problem I had wasn't as bad as the problem this guy had with his hands. Okay, I don't want to exaggerate. But I looked down and my fingers were all swollen up like breakfast sausages and my, the palms in the back of my hands and into my wrist all swollen up. What the hell is going on here? So I went to see my doctor and uh, had to take two buses across town because as it happened, my wife was away then. I take two buses across. I went to see the doctor, and I heard those words from the doctor that you never want to hear when you go to see the doctor. She said, I have never seen anything like this before. I have no idea what's wrong. <laughs> so my hands were killing me. She sent me to a specialist who eventually said, well, it's about six weeks later. He said, you've got inflammation of all your tendon sheets. He said, don't worry. It'll go away in about six weeks. Well, That'd be how many, 20 some years later, I still have the pain in my hands. It's never gone away. The swelling is gone, but the pain is still there. I'd say that's a bit of a lemon. Well, at the time that this happened, these things really hurt. Just writing, writing a note, that still hurts. I can't write, filling out a form, you know, change a grade form or something like that. By the time we get to the end, my hand is just killing me. Well, at the time, it was even worse. I, couldn't, I could do hardly anything with my, with my hands. And I had work to do. You know, Christmas break was over, I was getting back to work. I had three honor students that year. And they were giving me things like, here's the first draft of my introduction. Here's the method section. And I had to give them feedback on this. And I couldn't really write more than a few words at a time. So I thought, I'm gonna have to think outside the box here. And so what I did was, I went out and I purchased a couple of these. It's an old-fashioned little mini cassette recorder. Got a couple of them. And what I did was I started recording the feedback that I gave to my thesis students. And it worked beautifully. It worked fabulously. It was much better than writing or typing. And I continue to do it to this day. So the steps in the process are really simple. Read the student's draft, make some marginal notes, and back then I couldn't write very much at all, so I was just, I'd underline things. Got a comment here. And now I can make more extensive marginal notes, but still not much. Record detailed feedback based on the notes. So I sit there, after I've gone through everything, I sit there and put my little recorder next to me. I now use a digital recorder, of course. <laughs> put my little digital recorder next to me, and I just go through and talk, talk. Oh, you know, here on the first page, I think paragraph three should come before paragraph two. Here's why. Give a little explanation of, of, of the rationale. Give the student the MP3 file via Dropbox. I just load it up, they load it down, and they're off, ready to go. The student uses the feedback to make the revisions, submits the next draft, and then we do it again and again and again until I look at it and say, this is good, we're done. It works fabulously well. I heartily recommend it. <laughs> think about it. It has. Huge advantages, really efficient, because talking is so much easier than writing or typing for anybody, I think, not just for me. 
nonverbal communication, intonation and stress. Broader coverage, same amount of time I can cover more stuff more deeply. And at whatever level I want, I can just say, let's talk about structural issues with this draft. Or I can actually get into sentence structure. This sentence will work much more effectively if you turn it around, things like that. More efficient than face-to-face -face meetings. I, I used to often sit down with my students and I'd have a draft and they'd have a draft. And I'd say, uh, the fifth line here, and uh, which line is that? Oh, this one, and be giving feedback like that. It took forever, it was so inefficient. The student would go to home and they'd have all these notes they wrote. What was he talking about there in line five? I, I don't remember. I can't, think, can't figure it out. Much more efficient than face-to-face. -face. Let students listen to their feedback anytime, anywhere, as much as, as often as they want to. And then, of course, we can still have our face-to-face -face meetings, but we use them differently. We use them to talk about what has been going on instead of what's on line number five. So out of that problem with my hands, I came up with a, what I found to be a phenomenally useful teaching technique. I've used it in other settings. In my Psych2F23 class, I record a solution, an audio recording of a solution for every homework and every exam problem. So that at the appropriate time, these get loaded up on Sakai and students can go and just click on it. And say, oh, I couldn't figure out problem number 79, but oh, then they hear Dave's friendly voice saying, you know problem 79? This is how you do it. And this is why you have to use this technique to do it. And here's a pitfall. If you ended up with 3.42, maybe what you did was this. And so students get all kinds of excellent feedback via audio. And this past year, we had 6,684 hits on those audio solutions. So they really paid off. I only had to make them once because we use the same problems in the homework set year after year. And every year, we're getting thousands of hits. And most recently, Tanya Martini, who's uh, here this morning, uh, is teaching our Psych 3F40 course, Psychological Research, and she and I talk a lot about uh, a lot of issues, including teaching and learning related issues. And she's been using it to give feedback on submitted work in that course. And just to put this into a context for you, she used it a couple of years ago, and this was an email from one of her students. I'll let you have a quick read of that. Very positive feedback. Students like this. When it's done well, it really works extremely well. Student recommends keeping the method, and here's the part I like best. I'm almost excited to write the next draft. <laughs> How cool is that? The students are excited to get to the next draft instead of saying, oh, I gotta write the damn thing again. They're excited to get to the next draft. So it can really be extremely powerful. So if life hands you a lemon, make lemonade. Think about where you are and what you can do with the circumstances that you find yourself in. This is Daniel Borston, a writer and historian, uh, worked in, uh, in Washington for many years. The greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it's the illusion of ignorance. And I, I've always been fascinated by illusions. Let me show you a visual illusion first. This is a gateway arch in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, it's quite a, quite a structure. It's the gateway to the west. So as you're looking through it, this is the Mississippi River down here at the front. You can see the cars here, so you get some idea of the scale of this thing. It's really, really large. 630 feet tall. Where does the illusion come in? When people look at this, it appears to them, and it probably appears to you, that it's much taller than it is wide. In fact, it's exactly the same. 630 feet bottom to top, 630 feet side to side. Height and width are actually identical. Sometimes you're looking at the world and you think you know what you're seeing, but you're wrong. And what I'd like to do is to take this idea about the danger of illusions, the illusion of knowledge, and take it into our teaching and learning setting. Take a look at this. Would you be surprised if I told you that this is the grade distribution in an undergraduate course? Probably not. Yeah, some people get A's, 25% got B's, big lump in the middle, 41% got C's, and then some D's and some failures. Yeah, makes sense. That's not what it is. It's something very different. 
frankly, something much more disturbing. The researcher here, a fellow by the name of Bremi, did some work a couple of years ago, trained teachers to use a grading rubric, and then gave all of the teachers the same essay to grade. This is the grade distribution for the same essay by 76 <coughs> trained teachers. Oh my gosh. Think about what that means. If I've submitted an essay and it's been graded, there were some folks out there who would have given me an A, and there's some other folks out there who would have given me an F for that same piece of work. I could have got any grade in <laughs> anywhere in there. How sloppy is the measurement of student achievement when we're seeing that? When we do our grading of our students' work, we do our evaluation and say, this is A work, this is B work, this is C work. We have to be very thoughtful of our ability to do that. Now, there's some techniques that can help you to do a better job, but you really do have to think about it. It doesn't happen automatically. When I used to teach my psychology of eating course uh, a number of years ago, I remember how difficult it was to take especially a stack of essays and to go through and have anything like consistency. When all the essays were on different topics, written sometimes from different perspectives, and I had to go through and come up and say, well, this one is better than this one, so it should get a higher mark. It's hard work. And certainly, even if you're grading relatively short pieces on an exam, if you've got a lot of students, you're a different person at the top of the pile than you are when you get to the end of the pile, okay? You're tired, you're cranky by the time you get to the end, whereas you were fresh and ready to go at the top of the pile. We have to be very thoughtful about this because it's all about fairness. Our students are counting on us to evaluate their performance fairly and effectively. And it doesn't just fall into our laps. We have to work very hard to do that effectively. <coughs> For some of you who have been to my presentations, you've actually seen this question before. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to point out that, <coughs> pardon me, had a bit of a cold lately. Doesn't seem to want to leave me alone. You might think, well, multiple choice testing, no problem with respect to fairness, right? Everybody gets the same question. Get it wrong, pick the wrong answer, you get a zero. You get it right, it's a one. The scoring is completely objective. Once you've determined what the question is, what the correct answer is, scoring is completely objective. So no problems here, but there can be a lot of problems. There is nothing that guarantees that a multiple choice item is going to work well. To work well, a multiple choice item should be answered correctly, substantially more often by your best students than by your weakest students. Sort of by definition, that's the way the item should work. Better students should do better on it. Weaker students should do less well on it. Interestingly, when you look at multiple choice items and you look at them from that perspective, what you find is about 30% of the items on classroom tests are unsatisfactory. They're not doing that. Well, that means if you're giving a test that has 100 items on it, it means 30 items, about a 30 your test is just wasted. Or maybe even worse, because some of the items will actually work the wrong way around. The weakest students will be more likely to get it right than the strongest students, maybe because you've written the item so badly. So there's nothing, nothing, nothing that guarantees that multiple choice tests, objective as the scoring is, will give you good grading. So be really careful about that. Now, for many years, I've been studying multiple choice testing. And one of the things I really enjoy doing is to share what I've learned about multiple choice testing with, with colleagues, both at Brock and across the country. I've been giving a presentation on our new Scantron report recently. Our new Scantron report actually looks, allows you to look at each individual item on your test to determine whether it's working effectively. And in this presentation, which if you're using multiple choice testing at all, I hope you'll come to sometime, you will learn how to do that. 
And I also give presentations getting the most out of multiple choice questions, which deal with two major issues. How do you write good questions that are going to work well to sort out who knows more and who knows less? And also, how to write items that are not going to just test what students can remember. We want to test higher level cognitive processing, not simply, do you remember this? Do you remember this? Do you remember this? And we focus on some of those issues there as well. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. But when you're doing your teaching, look before you leap. Okay, I think these aphorisms go nicely together. Okay? You won't get across unless you take the jump, but you better know what you're doing before you make that leap because you can get yourself into a lot of trouble. And I think this applies to our teaching as well. I mentioned that too often it's easy to get in the rut doing the same thing year after year after year after year. I want to take some risks. And I've taught mostly large classes uh, since I've been here at Brock. Uh, the smallest I've ever had was, I guess, probably around 60-ish. And I've had hundreds at a time. In a big class, there's no such thing as a small risk. Because if something doesn't work right, I see Kathy <laughs> nodding there. If something doesn't work right, you've got a big problem. The more students, the bigger the problem. So let me tell you about an experience where I did venture and I did gain but I made sure I looked first before I leaped. I met this fellow, Mike Epstein, at, of Ryder University at a meeting of Eastern Psychological Association in 1998. And uh, he's a fellow psychologist. His interest was in corrective feedback. You're doing something, you're not doing it quite right, somebody tells you, here's a better way to do it. So I think a perfect example of this in the physical realm is a golf lesson. You're swinging, the instructor says, well, wait a minute, hold your hands like this or move your hips like this, and now you'll be able to do a better job of it. Mike's interests were in learning in classroom settings, and he developed this thing, the immediate feedback assessment technique. And it's a really cool technique. It's a response form that students use when they're taking a multiple choice test. And the cool thing is it gives students, as it says, immediate feedback on every item as they're taking the test. So it actually becomes easier if you take a look at a form that has been used by a student taking a test. Now this was not actually used in Psych 1F90 because I don't think we've ever had a student at Brock named Jane Doe. But if Jane Doe had taken a 10 item quiz, we might have seen a response form that looks like this. When you see the response form and hold it in your hands, what you see is that for each of the four options, A, B, C, D, and for each of the items on the test, there are, there's a box and it's silvered over like a scratch and win lottery ticket. And what the student does is they look at item number one, they say, hmm, I think the correct answer is B. They scratch the silver off of box B, and as you can see, the student finds the star first try and gets a point. They knew the answer. They're getting immediate confirmatory feedback. You knew it. You got it right. You can go on to the next item. You can stop thinking about item number one now. Okay? Sometimes, of course, the student doesn't get it right on the first try. Item number two, the student thought, hmm, it looks like D, scratch D. Hey, no star. I got it wrong. Hmm, A, B, and C are left. I think it's A. Ah, they scratch A, there's the star. Corrective feedback. I was wrong with D. But A is the correct answer. Student now knows the correct answer. 0.25 for that. Down here, took three tries. Student gets a little bit of marks. So we give part marks, depending on how many tries it takes. And down here, took all four tries. Sorry, no points for that. Add them all up. Instead of giving one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, just for the correct one, student ends up with 7.35 out of 10. Giving the part marks ensures that the student will continue to look for the star. So they find the right answer to every item. I took a risk. I introduced this into my own teaching a number of years ago. Notice when I did it, spring of 2000. I first met Mike in spring of 1998. It took me two years to put this into, into play. I made sure I learned as much as I could before I tried it in my own class. I also constrained the risk by teaching it in a spring course where the enrollment was smaller. If I was going to have a disaster, I'd have a smaller disaster. <laughs> and I told the students right off the bat, we're going to be doing something new. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to 
Try this technique. If you don't like it, you tell me. I gave them a little questionnaire. We'll, you'll never see it again. As it turned out, they loved it. There's lots of evidence that students learn more with the IFAT, and they show a strong preference for the IFAT as well. They really, really like it a lot. These are some of the comments that we got from the students. We had a lot of data on this, uh, on their acceptance of this technique. The comment that I like the best here, joys. When was the last time you heard students say something about joy on a test? Okay. The, the joys that I had when using the IFAD. By the way, students' acceptance of the IFAD is not related to any of these things, course grade, the mark they got on the multiple choice portion, the number of extra marks they earned, test anxiety, none of that matters. It's basically almost universally accepted by students. Nothing ventured, nothing gained. I wouldn't have been able to find this ph phenomenal technique and put it into action unless I'd been looking for it, scouting the landscape. But I made sure I looked before I leaped. And then I evaluated it to find out, yes, indeed, this is a good thing to be doing. Education is all a matter of building bridges. This is the Below Viaduct in, in the south of France. I think it's one of the most beautiful bridges I've ever seen. I think it just absolutely gorgeous. Education is about building bridges just like that. We help our students get to so many places by helping them to learn about the world. I'd like to take this thought though and turn it in a slightly different direction. Talk about what I see as being a big problem in higher education today. We've got all kinds of fabulous people who do research on teaching and learning promotion of teaching and learning as we have in the Center for Pedagogical Innovation. And we've got all sorts of classroom teachers who are busy, busily doing their everyday work in the classroom, doing wonderful work. But in between these two, there is a gulf, a huge gulf. Getting the word about things that we're learning about teaching and learning to the folks in the classroom is really, really difficult. People who are busy in the classroom often feel they just don't have the time to devote to hearing about the folks who are doing the work on research and teaching and learning. And the folks over here may be shouting at the top of their lungs, but the gap is so big that these folks are never hearing them. I think what we need are more bridges, better bridges that will connect the two and will increase the traffic flow from one side to the other. Illustration. Henry Rodiger, uh, Washington University, recently retired from there, has done research. I'll let you just read this yourself. There's a substantial body of evidence that frequent classroom testing and self-testing can improve education, help students to learn. And he points out, this is a bold claim that runs counter to current wisdom in educational circles. I often hear people, ah, don't want to spend time on testing, that's the wrong thing to be doing. Well, he's saying, no, we really do want to incorporate this into our teaching system. I did this, and I've been very happy with the results. And again, I've evaluated it, done some research on it. I put in place online multiple choice quizzes in Psych 223 a few years ago. Statistics course. A lot of people think you can't use multiple choice well in statistics, but you can if you know what you're doing. The purpose was to have these online quizzes serve as a progress check and an exam preparation. My exams have multiple choice on them, so they're getting a lot of practice with the concepts in the setting of multiple choice questioning on their quizzes. They get six quizzes via Sakai. Only two marks each, low stakes. It's 12 items per quiz, and these are chosen at random from a large bank. So for quiz number three, there's 250 items in the bank. Every time the student says, give me a quiz, they get 12 items drawn at random. They get 14 days in which to access each one of the six quizzes. And here's the interesting part. And this is where I went out on a limb. Unlimited attempts. They can do it as many times as they want. And only the highest mark counts. So let's say today you, say, you went, you, I got 11 out of 12. You can do it again. You're never jeopardizing that 11 out of 12. If that's the highest you ever get, that's the grade you're going to earn. 
But if you want to go for the 12 out of 12, feel free. Okay. Keep going. So unlimited attempts, only the highest mark counts. And after each quiz is completed, they get feedback on the correct answers. A couple of the findings. 94% of the students say the quizzes cover important material. Of course, you don't want to be testing trivia. You want to test important stuff, whether it's quizzes or your examinations. Quiz me, quizzes help me to know what to study more. Only a small group said I didn't like having the quizzes. 79% said I'd like these in other courses as well. They would help me in other courses. And here's an interesting thing, because I debated, should I be offering marks for this at all? Half the students said they wouldn't even look at it if it didn't count for marks. And I think this reflects something that we have to be very thoughtful about as instructors. When we say this counts for zero points, the subtext for the student is this has no value. Well, it can have a lot of value because, in fact, we found that performance on these quizzes predicts exam performance even when you take away the potential effects, for example, of overall grade point average and how much you like the course and things like that. So you partial all that out, as we would say in statistics, and you still get a substantial correlation between performance on the quizzes and performance on the exams. I want my students to look at the quizzes. <laughs> so two marks, yeah, I'll give you the two marks. This is primarily formative in nature. That's what it's for. So I think it's really important for us to be having better bridges between what's going on in the research world and what's going on in the classroom so instructors have a better idea of what to do to improve the way their students are going to be learning. So I think an important goal for the future, we need to increase the flow of traffic on this really important bridge. And I think that's something we have to do from an institutional perspective. I've been, I've been on the bridge a lot in the last 12 years, by the way. I've been running back and forth on that bridge, giving presentations on multiple choice testing across the country. And Jill mentioned this at the beginning, and I'm going to close with this. For me, I don't think there's anything that's been more influential in my life than this. My life as a teacher has been shaped by this. A teacher affects eternity. You can never tell where his influence stops. I'll give you two quick examples. Back in the 1980s, I had attended CPA, Canadian Psychological Association meeting. Was wandering around, looking at the posters. And there was a young lady at one of the posters, and uh, she was presenting her a PhD research there. She was about to be defending. She was presenting her PhD research on a poster. And um, we started to chat, because I was interested in the topic. And she said, oh, you taught me introductory psychology back in, I think it was like 1976 at the University of Waterloo. And I used to teach like two or 300 students at a time, and I quite frankly didn't remember her. And I, so we started chatting. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, I taught a lot, lot of students there. I said, uh, you know, I, I guess you were just one of the students who took it as elective and then, or, or as, a, as an undergraduate student your first year and went on to continue to major in psychology. And she said, no, no, no. She said, I was in third year of my program. And I took your introductory psych course. And I enjoyed it so much. And you made it seem like such fun that I changed majors in the third year of my program. And I went on to major in psychology. And now I'm getting my PhD. And I, I thought, wow. And that was, the time, that was the first time it really hit me how true this statement is. We influence lives in ways that we don't even think about. More recently, I had a student who was uh, in my course. She was struggling. And she was clearly having some personal difficulties. And she came in to see me, and she was asking for, you know, I need some extensions on this and that and the other. And I said, sit down, let's talk. We talked a little bit about what was going on in her life. And I said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. You need these extensions, I'll give them to you. But you're going to have to do something for me. You're going to have to go and go get some help for yourself. And I referred her to what I thought was an appropriate place for her to be going. And, uh, she did that. I gave her the extensions, and things seemed to be working out quite nicely as time passed. And uh, she recently sent me an email, or not an email, she sent me a card. And uh, she wrote in the card that what I had done for her had been so, so important. And it wasn't really about the stuff of statistics. It was about how I helped her to make it through a rough patch in her life. 
So there's a lot of what we do as teachers that influences people in very important ways. That young lady is a little bit better off because of something I was able to do for her. I wasn't thinking really that I was doing her a favor, quite honestly, as I did it. I thought, I'm making you a deal because you need to get some help for yourself and I want you to succeed in my course. Let's make a deal. And it's, it worked out quite nicely for her as it, as it happens, fortunately. So I leave you with this closing thought, a teacher affects eternity. You can never tell where his influence stops. Whenever you're working with your students, keep this in the forefront of your mind. I think it will always serve you well. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate your coming, and I hope you have a wonderful morning. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.